Hello. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you all tonight to the program on exploring creative longevity with Mark Friedman, the founder of Civic Ventures, Tim Carpenter, the founder of Engage, and moderated by Joanne Wood uh, Webb of the Actors Fund. So tonight's program evolved from a series of discussions between myself and Joanne Webb from the Actors Fund about the importance and the joy of finding rich, meaningful, and satisfying work. It's not something that we generally get to stumble into right after school, but it's usually something we find by a series of experiments and mishaps and failing better over and over again. Some people never feel like they've found meaningful work for themselves. Some people find it outside of their career, in their family life, in volunteering, in competitive sports, and myriad other ways. Some people find it in their jobs, and then they feel lost when they retire, and they're not sure how to reconnect with that same powerful feeling of engagement when they were, that they had when they were collecting a paycheck. So tonight's program is for all of us who would like to come up with some new approaches to using our accumulated experience in new ways and to possibly enrich not only our own lives, but impart some of our learned wisdom to contribute to our communities as well. When I was making my own career transition from the film industry to museum work, which was one of many major career transitions I've undertaken over the years, it was Joanne Webb and the Actors Fund who really helped me enormously with career guidance, finding, um, to working through the process of figuring out what my values were, what my strengths are, and how to take the experience I had accrued and make it totally relevant in a new field. So hopefully Joanne will tell you more about the services of the Actors Fund when she comes out. Joanne Webb has a broad background in the entertainment arena as an actor, as well as behind the scenes in television production and promotion with Paramount, CBS, and ABC Television, and as editorial supervisor, artist, creative development manager for Disney, consumer products, products division, both in New York and Los Angeles. From there, she moved into training and development and career counseling, focusing her expertise on encouraging artists to explore and successfully discover new career paths that utilize their creative talents. Um, Webb further displayed her own talents, first as a career counselor, and now as the new director of the Actors Fund Work Program. She prides herself in her proven ability to motivate and collaborate with creative people and organizations, enabling them to succeed in their strategic goals, enhanced through community alliance. And I say from personal experience that she does a great job at all of that. Next speaker who will speak second uh, is Mark Freeman. Mark Freeman is CEO and founder of Encore.org. He spearheaded the creation of Experience Corps, which is now one of America's largest nonprofit national service programs, which engages people over 55. And he created the Purpose Prize, which provides $500,000 prizes each year to social innovators in the second half of life. So that's something to work towards. Mark is also the author of The Big Shift, Navigating the New Stage Beyond Midlife, as well as Encore, Finding Work That Matters in the Second Half of Life, and Prime Time: How Baby Boomers Will Revolutionize Retirement and Transform America. Please, that would be so great. Um, and the kindness of strangers, adult mentors, urban youth, and the new volunteerism. So please join me in welcoming Mark Friedman. Um, thirdly, uh, we're gonna, the first actual speaker is going to be Tim Carpenter. Tim is the founder and executive director of Engage. He catalyzed the creation of the Burbank Senior Artists, Artists Colony, which was a first-of-its-kind senior apartment community with high-end arts amenities and programs. He also serves on the board of the National Center for Creative Aging. In 2008, he was selected an Akosha Fellow for being one of the top social entrepreneurs in the world. And in 2011, he received the very prestigious James Irvine Foundation Leadership Award. He's also the producer and the host of the radio show Experience Talks on KPFK. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tim Carpenter. Thank you very much, Claudia, and thank you uh, for the act to the Actors Fund, all the great people here at the Hammer, and, and my esteemed colleagues that I'm going to speak with tonight. It's interesting talking about creative longevity sitting here in Los Angeles, California, and not one of us has a brochure about Botox. So we're going to try and get through this with, with all of your help. 
So one of the things that I want to talk about, one of, one of the th we, we live in this country called the United States of America, and, and I want to define the problem we have, we have decided is, is this thing called aging, getting older in America. I speak in front of audiences quite a bit about getting older, and I often ask the audience how many people would like to get older, and about 50% of the people raise their hands, which tells us that we live in a country that prefers the alternative to getting older, which I've always found kind of odd. And they, I, I first started in aging in healthcare and, and got tired of bashing my head against the, the Medicare brick wall that's gotten so much better as I've gotten out of it. But um, I, I walked into one of these places called the Senior Apartment Community, a retirement community, about 15 years ago. And they had two things on the calendar that people could look forward to every week, bingo and donuts. And, and I thought, if this is the bar that I have to jump into, I'm going to look like a genius in this industry. Um, bingo, not, not that exciting of a, of a game. And donuts, as we know, is a food, not an activity, and one that's really not very good for us. So uh, what we decided to do at Engage was to, t was to turn that model upside down. We started looking at housing models all over the country and realized there wasn't one first. For starters, we threw the idea of, of copying a housing model out the window. And what we did was look at college. And college, if you look at it through the right set of goggles, is a very similar experience to retirement. It's a launching off point. It's a new part of your life. And when I went to college, other than being drunk quite a bit, somebody, when I was walking down the hall of my dorm, handed me this college catalog. And I opened it up, and I started flipping through the pages. And what I realized was I could be anything. I could do absolutely anything with my life. And we work in a business where the first point of entry that we see people at, a lot of times it's a widow coming in after a loss. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if, if a charming, tall, strapping guy like me handed that woman a college catalog and said, you can do anything you want with the rest of your life. And that was the start of the what if for us. And the, the idea first was, let's hire professors, let's hire professional level teachers. You know, we looked at models in assisted living and they had these things called activity directors where someone at two o'clock teaches writing and then they magically transform into the basket weaving teacher at four. And when you're working eight hours a day teaching programming, no one is that interesting. I'm a really funny, you know, exciting guy, and I could not do that for a living ever. I, give me an hour and I'm done. I got 12 minutes up here and I'm, I, I'm off the stage. But the, the idea of, some, of change, the idea that, that everything gets old, if, if somebody accidentally did a program right in housing, if they had some writing class on Tuesday afternoon, they'd kill it by duration because it would be the writing class that was at Tuesday at 2 o'clock forever. And so what we did was we hired professional level teachers, we teach things on a semester basis, they rotate out just like college, and then we use these things called culminating events, where people have an opportunity to use the skills that they're learning in these classes in real life application. So for te teaching a writing class, we stage plays, they can write films, we have writing, uh, it's staged writing events, poetry slams, whatever it may be to get people utilizing the skills. If they're taking an art class, we have an art show. Wellness classes culminate in, in our Senior Olympics program or, or dance, dance experiences at the communities. The other thing that we also like is the idea of free. <laughs> Because the, the one thing that I think, we serve a lot of lower income seniors and we do it on site for free. So we eliminate cost and transportation from the concept of I want to go to a class. And we want everyone to be involved in it. We're not treating people who are, are already attending something at a community college or a senior center. We want to get everybody involved in these types of programs. And the other thing is cool. Um, I, I, I know that if you call something cool, it almost immediately doesn't become cool. 
But aging is cool. You know, I grew up in a large Irish Catholic family, and, and if, if anybody's Irish, and it, storytelling is a competitive sport. And it happened at the dinner table in our family, and I realized very early on that older people tell a lot better stories than younger people do, and I just ended up at that end of the dinner table. And we, we also have this, this radio show called Experience Talks where every week... We get to talk to these amazing people. I was the, the people who are sitting in the Billy, Wild, Billy and Audrey Wilder chairs, the, the brown ones there. I was telling my daughter who was here that I interviewed Tony Curtis about six weeks before he died. And, and you remember when he was talking about that film, Some Like It Hot, to sit and be able to talk to Tony Curtis about his life, I think that that's something that we ought to applaud and raise up. So several years ago, we met this guy named Clarence Johnson. People call him CJ. And he's a jazz drummer. He's getting up there in age. He's, he's in his 80s and, and still gigs. And he's a jazz drummer. He didn't put away a lot of money. He's not that organized of a guy. But he can play the drums. He's a pretty serious guy. He's played with Charlie Parker and Miles Davis and Dinah Washington. And he's a walking story. You could sit and listen to this guy tell stories forever. But what happened with Clarence at one point is he couldn't get arrested to play drums. He's an older guy, and you know how we feel about older people in this country. They want younger folks on the drums, so he just wasn't getting the kind of gigs to be able to support his family. And so what we did was, and Mark, Mark Friedman's going to talk about the concept of encore in a little bit, but Clarence's encore is he's a drummer, um, we have these things in our communities called drum circles, and we need somebody to, to facilitate drum circles, and Clarence can spin a tail as well as anybody I've ever seen. So the concept of playing drums, talking, and in exciting people about the concept of rhythm was very exciting to Clarence, and so we thought, we'll repurpose him. We'll get him gigs by virtue of, of making him a teaching artist instead of just having him try and get up on stage and play drums. The, the G Clarence is the guy on the right. The gentleman in the picture here with the ponytail is a guy named John Fitzgerald from Remo Drums, which is one of the largest suppliers of drums in the world. And we went to John and said, you know, we've got this guy. He doesn't know how to facilitate drum circles. Could we teach him? We'll go out and get a grant. We can pay for it, whatever you want to do. He says, well, what's the guy's name? And I said, Clarence Johnson. And, and John said, Clarence Johnson was my first drum instructor when I was like 14 <laughs> years old. So there's a, there's a little bit of divine intervention in the story of Clarence's reclarification as a drum circle facilitator. So we got Remo Drums involved, and we went to this foundation called the Percern Foundation, who was starting up a program to retrain older artists to try and create social innovation and social change in the community. So it's this idea of someone who has skills, who has something that they have to offer, and for some reason they're looked past, they're put aside. You know, we, we're, we're in the epicenter of that. You know, the idea of Hollywood, th there, like, there comes a point where if you're an actor or a writer, I love that story several years ago about the woman who lied about her age, that she was younger than she was so she could write for a television show, and then got fired when they found out about it. So... Clarence started doing these drum circles and, and, and does them all over the place. And, and uh, the reason I tell this story is that this is an example of what we can do to be creative around social change, try and find ways for artists to teach and cause social change. The people that Clarence does this for are, are his peers, but he's also this guy who, he's an extraordinary man who's doing something relatively ordinary now. It's a little bit of the reverse of the normal story. Um, and that's what we're all about in, in what we do in Engage. And we'll talk some more in the, uh, in the question and answer period. I want to welcome to the stage my esteemed colleague, Mr. Mark Friedman from Encore.org, so please welcome him. Before I, I start, I'd like to play a little film about the Purpose Prize, which is a prize that honors people who are working at the intersection of creativity and social change in the second half of life. Maine has got one of the highest foreclosure rates per capita in the country. 
Mr. Oathouse, a carpentry work slowed down, and he got three months behind on his mortgage. It's nothing they did wrong. Life caught up with them. The goal for all of our work is to save the house. The Maine Attorney Saving Homes Project is a group of private pro bono lawyers who represent homeowners facing foreclosures. My work in the legal profession has come in many ways full circle. I've represented banks in litigation cases, putting together business loan deals. When the savings and loan crisis came along, we went almost overnight from putting together business transactions to foreclosing on these people I knew on a first-name basis. I'd literally written the book on how to do foreclosures in Maine. The whole mix of what that did to my career was really troubling, and I ended up leaving the practice to try to get some semblance of peace from what the banking crisis had brought into my life. I thought I was really done. I thought I would never come back into the legal profession. I came to the volunteer lawyers at the moment when they were setting up the main attorney saving homes project. I took this deposition back in the summer of 2010 that broke open the fraudulent practice of mortgage loan servicers to sign thousands of documents a month in foreclosure cases. The fraudulent conduct that I was able to expose was the initiating step in a 50-state attorney general investigation and led to a $25 billion settlement. This case gets moved from the district court in Rockland. I'd given hope that anyone was going to help us. Trying to deal with all the paperwork and stuff ourselves was extremely overwhelming. This isn't just about our financial woes. This is about our family. This house was built for them. It wasn't built for a bank. It was built for, for the kids. Mr. Oathout was severely depressed over what was happening to him and his family. And I know what depression is because I've been through that earlier in my career. And when the judge entered the ruling in that case, he looked at me. He said, what's that mean? He said, it means the foreclosure's over. You're going to keep your house. He put his head down on the table and he sobbed for a minute or two. And then the next thing I know, he had him he wrapped in his arms, a big bear hook. And uh, how sweet is that? I'm completely incompetent at using PowerPoint, so I feel a vast sense of relief that the one slide I was going to show tonight is actually <laughs> appearing behind me. Not too long ago, I, I had lunch with a guy who'd been very successful in his midlife career. He had run a major news network, and at the end of the lunch, he told me that he had joined the Pip Squad. And I said, the Pip Squad? You know, he was about 65 years old. He didn't seem to me to be somebody who's likely to be part of any Pip Squad. And he said, yeah, previously important persons. <laughs> and, and he said, uh, you know, I, there are about five of us in the, in the squad right now, and we, we have a motto. And I said, well, well what's, what's the motto? He said, the world may be done with us, it's just we're not done with the world. <laughs> and I could imagine Tom Cox and the now nearly 400 Purpose Prize winners and fellows uh, who've accumulated over the last seven years, people who are um, doing their best work in the second half of life. And, you know, we're, we're used to previously important persons doing great work. This is the era of Mayor Bloomberg and Bill Clinton changing the world, Bill Gates transforming philanthropy. There are lots of people who've done great things in in the middle of their lives and continue to do great things. But one of the, the, one, the wonderful realizations in seeing the, all these hundreds of Purpose Prize winners and fellows and the thousands of nominations from which they're chosen is that there is also a pop squad, <laughs> previously ordinary people. Tom Cox is, is an example. You know, we, um, 
Um, we hear a lot about reinvention, but a lot of the stories like Tom's that come through the Purpose Prize are, are stories of redemption. He talked about his own battles with depression, his career, which went in a direction he had never intended it to go in. In fact, at the end of his legal career, he had uh, uh, was no longer speaking with his children. He was depressed. His wife left him. He felt so awful. He says in the film that he thought he was done. He actually started building houses. He became a carpenter as a kind of project of redemption and eventually went to legal services in Maine to, uh, to try to draw on those earlier skills. And I could tell you a, a hundred stories like Tom's. One of my favorites is also from New England. It's the story of a guy named Robert Chambers who had been in the Vietnam War Never had to drop out of college, worked in mid-level positions in the banking business and tried to retire to New Hampshire. And when he got up there, he wanted to ride his bike. He realized he didn't have enough money like so many other people in their 60s. So he started working at the only job he could get, which was selling used cars. And pretty quickly, he realized that the agency selling the cars was making all their money by taking advantage of unsophisticated rural buyers. They even had a name for them. They called them woodchucks, and they had training seminars on how you take advantage of, of woodchucks. And one day, a guy is driving away, having been sold a car that had maybe nine months left on it and a five-year loan at 15% because his credit was bad, smoke belching out of the back, and and Chambers realized that in, in nine months or a year, that car was going to die, and this guy was not going to be able to buy another one because he had this usurious loan, and he wasn't going to be able to work because if you live in rural New Hampshire, you need a car to work, and his family was going to fall apart, and his community was going to suffer, and he realized he couldn't, he couldn't abide by that anymore. And so he plotted and planned, and he left, and he started something called Bonnie Clack, um, the CLAC stands for Car Loans and Counseling, and it was an agency that provides credit counseling, a nonprofit, low interest loans, and fuel efficient new cars to low income rural buyers in northern New England. And he picked CLAC because he's a fan of car talk of click and clack. <laughs> he <laughs> thought it was an homage to, to them. So all these, uh, all these members of the pop squad, uh, like Robert Chambers and, and Tom Cox, uh, give me a source of hope. I mean, partly just in, in the, the possibilities ahead, that even if we haven't ended up, you know, starting, uh, been president of the United States or, you know, starting a high-tech company in midlife, there's still hope that, that the best is, is ahead of us. And it's also a, a powerful rejoinder to this notion in our society that Tim alluded to that creativity, genius, innovation, entrepreneurship are the exclusive province of young people. Young people are obviously wonderful in, in all of those areas, but there's been a, an underappreciated, undiscovered continent of genius and innovation in the society, and that's in older people. In fact, there's an economist at the University of Chicago, David Galenson, who studied the value of all kinds of art and creativity in all kinds of fields from painting, sculptor, and discovered, um, he, he tried to find out the age of artists when they did their most valuable work, and it, gr it grouped in two areas. It, a lot of, a lot of uh, the artists were very young, and a lot of them were very old. And what he realized in all of his research is that conceptual genius blooms early and experimental genius blooms late. So it turns out Cezanne's most valuable work is done in his late 60s. Louise Bourgeois, the great sculptor, is teaching middle school in Great Neck, New York in her 60s, having never done anything of significance. Her most valuable work is done in her 80s. And I think at a time, you know, when Tim uh, it started, he talked about the problem. We've got this longevity paradox. We're working tremendously hard to live longer. We've got an enormous number of people who've succeeded in doing that. And instead of celebrating it, we're convinced that it's the worst thing that ever happened to us. You know, and how can it be that the best thing for us as individuals, these longer, healthier lives, has to be a collective calamity, the worst thing that's happened to us as a society? I think we can turn that around and realize the true promise in the longevity revolution. You know, half the kids born since the year 2000 in the developed world are projected to see their 100th birthday. So we're not just talking about the baby boomers or a brief blip, but, but the future. 
how can we turn that into something that's good for individuals and good for the society? I think the key lies in bringing a kind of creativity to thinking about and shaping this whole period of life. And I'd like to propose that we invent a new stage of life uh, in the years that, that follow midlife and before we're truly elderly, which sounds like a crazy idea. Life stages seem like uh, fixtures, but in fact, they're fictions. And this period that all these baby boomers are arriving at in their 60s, I think is uncharted territory. You know, we're told on the one hand that 60s, the new 40, we're supposed to be younger than we actually are, but you get senior citizen discounts at, you know, 50. <laughs> so 60 sort of the new 80 at the same, old 80 at the same time, it's the new 40. I think 60 is the new 60, and these hordes of people, all those tens of millions of, of folks who are flooding into that period are something entirely new on the landscape. They're denizens of a stage of life that has yet to even be given a name. I asked my, uh, my mother-in-law, who's somebody who does the New York Times crossword puzzle with great facility, <laughs> as I uh, was approaching a publishing deadline for this last book, what that name should be. I figured she was my last best hope, and she told me that she had actually figured out, and I said, Donna, <laughs> tell me, I, I, gotta, I gotta write this down right away and send it off to the publisher. She said, yeah, you know, I'm on my next to last dog. The way she figures it, that she had about seven years left in her current pooch, and then she could get maybe a 14-year model, you know, mid-size. <laughs> and it wasn't that she's going to be ready for the, uh, the, the grave at that point, but you've got to clean up after it and all that. You know, we're used to measuring life in dog years. So whatever the name for this period is, I think we need to move beyond the current notions, you know, of 60 being the new 40 or the old 80, or for that matter, all these oxymorons we hear about this period, the young old, the working retired, you know, the walking dead. <laughs> so <laughs> I think if we break through, if we reshape this period uh, in a way that draws on the true gifts of people at this stage, you know, the idea of a new stage between midlife and old age is actually 100 years old. Uh, a guy by the name of G. Stanley Hall, who was the person who invented adolescence, 20 years after he invented adolescence at the age of 60, said, actually, I made a big mistake. I should have never invented youth. I should have invented this new stage between midlife and old age. And he described it as an Indian summer. And he said that human beings don't reach the height of their capacity until the shadows start slanting eastward. <laughs> And in that beautiful phrase, this idea of, of wisdom and action, of capacity and longevity kind of coming together, this great sweet spot powered by demography, I think could help solve a lot of problems in our society, along with being a windfall of talent, could be a great surge of creativity. And I'll close by saying that I think is the most important potential benefit of all, which is to bring back the notion of generativity in our society, which sounds like a, an obscure word, but all it really means is investing in future generations, right? That was always the American project. It was the immigrant dream. It's, all, it's, it's the human project, because as we get older, we think about our, our mortality, and we realize that we don't live forever. The road doesn't go on endlessly, and that we live through what we contribute to future generations. Eric Erickson, the great psychologist of this period, said that the hallmark of success in this time of life could be encapsulated in the phrase, I am what survives of me. And it makes me think of this great proverb, and I'll, I'll close with this. A, a society grows great when old men plant trees under which they know they will never sit. And I think today we have an opportunity to plant those trees to not only leave a legacy, but to live one. And in this final video that I wanna show you, uh, it, it provides an illustration of somebody who's doing just that. Thank you. You're not growing, you're dying. Hubie's basically the, the youngest person I know. The status quo is unacceptable. It's his vision and his ability to explain his vision to you. Uh, you can't help but be swept up in it. Stasis is unacceptable. He really paved the road for all of this and 
I'm just, I'll be forever indebted to him. Uh, let's just start, see what happens. Oh, one, two, three, ready, and sing. When the Boston Children's Chorus walks onto a stage, uh, this very diverse choir singing in a level of excellence, Boston sees what it can become. My vision and my hope is that when these young people are 50 years of age, they look back on their experience and say this was one of the most important experiences in my social development as a young person. You know, collectively, how does risk taking then uh, play itself out in, in an everyday rehearsal situation? Not even just performance, but everyday rehearsal. Yeah. Like in sight reading, you got to keep going. Um, you got to sing with confidence. And if you don't take the risk of being wrong, you're definitely not going to sing the right note if you don't sing at all, you know? Right. Absolutely. So even when you don't know, a friend of mine who he said, you know, I'd like to nominate you for the Purpose Prize. The Purpose Prize uh, provides an, an award for, for people who, uh, in their encore careers, in their so-called retirement years, continue to do important things that are of value to the society. I did receive the award in 2010, and it's very improbable. It was an improbable journey. Okay, I had tried other means to bring young people together but nothing like this. I think the whole notion of retirement years and the way we used to think about it, uh, you know, actually doesn't make any sense. If you don't use your, your talents, uh, your, your brains, and your body, you will uh, go into atrophy. I quote, I often quote uh, Marion Wright Edelman, the president of the Children's Defense Fund. Service is the rent we pay for living. A long time ago, I made the decision not to be a squatter on the land, but to pay my rent. That's what I do. I pay my rent. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joanne Webb. I am the director of the Actors Fund Work Program, Western Region, and I am so pleased to be here. Somebody needs to pinch me to tell me I'm not dreaming, because uh, a long, <laughs> thank you, I'm not dreaming. Uh, a long time ago, uh, actually, it's very interesting how all this came together. Um, I, uh, I've actually worked with the organization Engage and actually uh, bring a few people over to you guys to be able to uh, do their work over there and repurpose themselves. And I've also, uh, when I was working there, uh, my dear friend uh, Maureen Kellen Taylor, who I know is here, uh, she uh, who, who is uh, works with Engage, and she actually sh lent me a book called Encore, and I read that book and it it really connected my heart so much. Uh, I working at at uh, the um, uh, w with Tim and with Maureen and with all these incredible seniors. Um, shifted the paradigm for me, because I was never around seniors a whole lot in growing up. And, um, and shortly after that, I uh, went and I worked uh, at, I got a position at the Actors Fund uh, to become a career counselor at that time. And uh, this was right after the writer's strike, and uh, all of a sudden, all these people that were baby boomers and uh, filled with vitality, really incredible what they could do, all of a sudden the phone stopped ringing. And we ended up doing a baby boomer breakfast in a group, and um, and it. Did you uh, guys have donuts. We had, <laughs> y we had whatever. I don't think we did do donuts. I think when Frank came along, uh, my my one of my uh, uh, social workers, he might have brought a donut or two, <laughs> but uh, we did it in such a way that uh, watching people be able to create community around them was remarkable. And so when this opportunity came and Claudia said, hey, I think it would be so terrific, it would just be amazing if we could do something with the Actors Fund. And we were trying to think, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I happened to see Tim at a uh, function uh, at uh, their organization. And all of a sudden, I said, oh, you know, it would be great to have you and, and uh, this guy Freeman, you know, <laughs> and bring them together and do something kind of fun. Uh, with and." They were interested. He said, let me give him a call. And then all of a sudden, then I'm calling Claudia, what do you think? And here we all are. So, you know, it's throwing those seeds out there. And I, I've been imagining this for a long time, and it's beyond my imagination now. 
Uh, I want to read some statistics. I'm not going to do a lot of reading, but I just want you to know why we're here. More people were 65 years and over in 2010 than in any previous census. Between 2000 and 2010, the population 65 years and over increased at a faster rate, 15.1 percent, than the total U.S. population, 9.7 percent. By 2015, those aged 50 and older will represent 45 percent of the U.S. population, according to AARP. Baby boomers make up 35 percent of the American adult population. By 2030, the 65 plus population will double to about 71.5 million and by 2050 will grow to 86.7 million people, according to the U.S. Census. In 2050, the number of Americans aged 65 and older is projected to be 88.5 million, more than double its projected population of 40.2 million in 2010. So that's why we're here. Uh, things are changing. And uh, one of the big things uh, I read in a book one time where they talked about if you had a house and you were going to expand a room on it, would it change the way that you lived in the house? And the answer is yes, it would. But the truth is we are exp people are living longer, you know, retirement is sh shifting, everything's changing. But a lot of things have to get changed in order to make things work. And so that's why we're here. So I'm going to ask some questions, and uh, we'll have a little conversation up here. And then um, we're going to leave a half an hour to be able, there's going to be some people with microphones, so the, the, the audience can ask questions uh, to uh, these two extraordinary gentlemen. Um, and we'll go from there, OK? Uh, it's interesting, uh, Mark, when you were talking, I was thinking about the book, The Learning Tree if anybody's ever read that book and just the, all the different ways that, uh, till you're an elder, you know, and uh, how important that is. Okay, uh, question for both of you. And uh, you both have taken areas of interest you had in helping boomers and seniors into a real mission to changing the paradigm. Beginning with Mark, could you each share when your interests transitioned into an actual mission? Mm. Well, I um, I had no idea that I would end up working on these issues around the second half of life. I spent the first 15 years of my career focused on young people and particularly got interested in the idea of mentoring for kids and was involved in the first study that had been done in, in a practically a century of the Big Brother Big Sister program. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered in the study is that the Big Brother Big Sister program was having a spectacular impact on the lives of kids. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that going to McDonald's and single-handedly undermining the longevity <laughs> revolution <laughs> through the ingestion of, of trans fats is really good for development of young people. <laughs> <laughs> but they, this study showed that that these big sisters and big brothers were having a 46 percent impact uh, difference on the um, kids starting to use drugs, a 50% difference in school truancy, you know, spectacular impact on kids' lives. Um, but there was a, a waiting list for Big Brothers Big Sisters that was half the size of the program at this point. And it raised this whole question, if these kinds of relationships, these things that only human beings could do, were so important, where are we going to find the human beings to do those things that only human beings could do? And that led to uh, an interest in older people because I felt like it was the one segment of, of the population where there was an enormous increase in the human capital and very little use as a society of this talent source. So it was kind of through the back door that I got interested in this issue. And it eventually consumed me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but look at the amazing work that you do internationally in terms of getting this word across. Well, your, your point about, I just wanted to throw in as you were reeling off those extraordinary statistics that we're actually young relative to other countries. Mm -hmm. So between 40 and 50 percent of Germany, Italy, Spain, South Korea, and Japan by mid-century will be over the age of 60. There will be 300 million people in China over the age of 60. So, you know, a country basically 
of people over 60 as big as the United States is now. So it, these changes that we're experiencing, as dramatic as they are, are actually modest relative to what much of Europe and Asia is going to see. Right, right, just because of the population difference and mm -hmm. everything. How about you, Tim? Uh, for me, Same yeah, walking into one of these apartment complexes where old people live, you know, it's interesting because senior housing, typically before we started doing this stuff, the one thing everyone had that lived there in common was that they were old. And that, that, doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily create the most interesting neighborly relationships that's kind of based mm -hmm. on how many medications are you on and does your elbow hurt nearly as much as mine? And so the, you know, the early concept was just to try and replace that with something cooler. Uh -huh. um, but walking into the first one, it was this place called Heritage Park in, in Duarte and walked into this club room and it had not been rehabbed yet. And you could peel the nicotine off the walls and there was the, the tried and true bingo machine in there and there was one guy sitting in the club room I just went over and sat down next to him and started talking to him. His name was John. And he was he, he just started talking a mile a minute and telling me his life story. And it turns out that he was the right hand man of Preston Tucker, who was who was the the guy that was profiled in the movie Tucker by Francis Ford Coppola, one of the maverick car makers in history, and told me this amazing story about following him around the country and basically creating all of the angles around how to sell the Tucker torpedo. And one of the most interesting guys, and I, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm Irish, so I'm a bit of a story addict, and I'll, I'll sit and listen to your story any day of the week and twice on Sunday. But he, he was so amazing, and, and I'm thinking he's sitting here in this clubhouse in Duarte all by himself, and so at the end of his story, I just said, John, what do you do here? And he said, I'm dying, that's what I'm doing here. And that was the moment for me that it just brought it home. And, and it wasn't like some huge dramatic, you know, the skies parted and the violins began. I just thought, this guy deserves better than that, you know. And, and truthfully, all of us deserve better than that. And the mission part of it, you know, there's some self-enlightened interest in this. I'd like a cool place to live when I get older, too. So. <laughs> I think we all have to be thinking about that we're creating not only what will happen for the people that are older now, but we're creating uh, that vision of what, what it's going to look like for us. And, um, and, and things have changed. We're living in a very different world than we, we ever thought it was going to be. I, I certainly didn't think it was going to be the way it is. And um, it's interesting, Mark, when you published your book Encore in 2007, which is a wonderful book, but it was before the whole <laughs> thing dropped, you know, as far as yeah. the economic and employment market uh, changed. I know even at the Actors Fund Work Program, uh, we found that people, the, we used to say, you, 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 before you were competing with each other and students for jobs, now you're competing for, with everybody else that's been laid off and downsized, mm -hmm. plus people who thought they could retire and have it had to come back into the uh, workforce, mm -hmm. right? So what's the difference between writing that book and then writing the shift later on and because where you did have a little bit more information about what's happening? Well, I, uh, you know, I just kept mouthing the same platitudes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> even in a different environment, you know, hoping that's it. But, but actually, I, you know, I, there, there is a big difference, um, obviously, in, the, in our view of, of um, what's possible in the economy from 2008. But I think, you know, as those numbers that you were reeling off suggest, this is a long-term permanent change that's going to happen in econo you know, economic situations that are good and bad. And the, the only way I, you know, a situation I can compare it to is the movement of so many millions of women into new roles in the 60s and 70s. And, and things weren't doing so well economically at that point either, and a lot of people were wringing their hands and saying, hey, this is a zero-sum proposition. All these women are going to come in and they're going to basically just displace their husbands, mm -hmm. and we're going to end up in the same place we started, but with a lot of pain and suffering along the way. But I, I, it doesn't really work like that in, in economic growth, that talent actually drives productivity. And that's certainly true when it comes to solving social problems. You know, it, you can't have too much talent. We hear all these numbers about dependency ratios. You know, we're going to have this small group of people in the middle and this vast group of people 
in later life and weighing everybody down and bankrupting posterity. But in, in fact, you know, there's another way to look at it, which is a kind of abundancy ratio. And, you know, take a look at what kind of impact all those women moving into new roles has had on our economic growth, on our societal progress. We would never be competitive globally if they weren't part of it. And so when you, I think when you look at the short term, it can seem like people are competing against each other, like it's a zero-sum proposition. But when you look over the long term, it's ju- it truly is an incredible windfall of talent um, that ultimately, I think, is going to be uh, a competitive strength for the nations that, that really make use of that talent, especially when you have you know, half of a whole set of countries in that age group. Yeah, the, the powers in the numbers in the other way. Right, in a certain right. Extent. Will it be yeah. a dependency ratio or an abundancy ratio? Definitely. Um, Tim, um, through Engage, you were able to create a 21st century model for building senior community. Um, what are you looking forward to in the n- going into the next decade? What's your what's the plan? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, the the thing that I love about what we do is is we're looking at ways to try and redefine community mm-hmm. through something called senior housing, but really what it is it's it's about trying to break down the walls and windows of what that means and make it a fabric of the community at large. You know, Maureen, can you just stand up and wave to everyone just quickly? This is Maureen Kellen Taylor, who's our who's our chief operating officer. Um, and and one of one of the things that we me- I m- we mentioned briefly the Burbank Senior Artist Colony. There there's a school for at-risk kids right next to the Burbank Senior Artist Colony, and every semester we put on programs there where senior artistic mentors from the building next door, crazy older seniors who are artists and musicians and writers and, and basically weird, and these kids who are, who are broken and th- thought of as bad kids, they've been thrown out of the educational system for anything from attention deficit to gun and drug charges and teetering on the edge of being in the juvenile correctional system for the rest of their life. And they, they experience these programs, and Maureen's put together these crazy programs where they've, they've made two-minute claymation videos with each other where a senior and a kid get together and literally make a claymation video. And there's this great one of this boxing match where you can see the kid's hands coming in, and they're doing the dialogue in the background. And the thing is, is it's this way to make a creative project around creating a reason for interaction between someone who wants to help and someone who needs help. And the principal of the school points out to us all the time that, that a lot of the times this is the first time one of these kids has ever experienced anyone loving them for simply the reason that they just love them. They're not a parole officer or a teacher or they're not related to them, they're not getting paid. It's just somebody in the crazy senior community next door who wants them to succeed and has some hand in them getting out of this mess that they've created for themselves and realizing what great kids they are. So a lot of times when we go into these neighborhoods where these housing communities are, Mm -hmm. what we're doing is trying to bond it together with some reason to be. You know, we just opened a new arts colony in NoHo, and it has an open to the public 80 seat theater in the lobby with a marquee and a box office. And the residents are involved in programming. People come and buy tickets. There's a theater company, the Road Theater Company in North Hollywood, which is an amazing theater company. And it creates this I- idea that there's something more to living in one of these places. There's, there's reason for it to have a, a greater impact. So that, I think, is what we're just trying to push the, the boundaries of what's possible. Yeah. I, I can remember a story with the kids uh, where I came over to see a documentary that, was, that had been put together mm-hmm. with, the, uh, with the elders and the, and the children. And, and they're not children. They're most of them are like teens or... or yeah, um, yeah. Uh, adolescent and they it was interesting because one of the mothers was up there and she said oh um, I can't I'll never forget we were going over to meet with the woman the senior and her name is Clara 
and she's, he, the boy was dressed in his Sunday suit, which he never even wore on Sundays, you know. And, he, and she said, well, why are you all dressed up? And he looked at her and he said, is that what you think you're going to wear, Mom? You know, we are meeting Clara, you know, like that, and she won't stand for that. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was so amazing that, you know, just that, that shift, you know, that people make based on relationships. So. And he's right. Clara would not have stood for it. No, him. she wouldn't have. I know Clara, <laughs> too. <laughs> I knew exactly who he was talking about at the same time. Mark, you showed us some stuff with um, the Purpose Prize, which is just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for so many people, uh, 60 and over, to be able to showcase what they're capable of doing and really plant seeds out there. Um, can you elaborate a little bit how that, that whole uh, program came into being? Sure. I, um, I, I got inspired by um, a number of sources, but one was a free health clinic uh, outside of San Francisco that had been created by a group of retired doctors. And I remember one of the doctors, a guy named Bill Schwartz, reca recounting a story of um, wa walking down the street and passing one of his previous uh, patients, and she went right by him and whirled around and said, didn't you used to be Dr. Schwartz? And he, uh, <laughs> um, but he's a guy who started, after he retired, he started volunteering at a local community organization um, two nights a week examining patients on the conference room table. And this line out the door started growing, so he started recruiting some other doctors and you know by the time he got done they had three clinics seeing 5,000 patients a year and he had his original training in um, in community health clinics and he just felt this great sense of giving back and but what was so inspiring I think about his story is that he wasn't a social entrepreneur in any kind of grand sense he was kind of an incremental entrepreneur and he, you know, just a step at a time, um, he had ended up doing this great work. And I felt like there were many other people like that, and yet they were rarely recognized. We had this idea that, you know, as I was saying earlier, creativity is, is about young people. But if it turns out that as a society, that older people are among the most creative. In fact, there's a new study that came out last week showing that older people, uh, yet again showing that older people are the most entrepreneurial group in society. When I mean, you have a societal attitude that tells people that they're over the hill at the point when they're actually about to do their greatest work, how much productivity, innovation, uh, entrepreneurship have we been losing? I mean, if it turns out that people are at this stage are the most entrepreneurial group and that goes completely against the cultural grain, what would happen if, and it goes to something I just wanted to pick up on that you said earlier, that, that wonderful Mary Catherine Bateson quote about the atrium in the house. If you change one room, I think if we if we make a monument out of what was the leftover years, this period of life, it's going to change what a whole life looks like. You know, when you're young, you realize that you don't have to try to do it all in the next 30 years. You have multiple bites at the apple. Maybe you shouldn't spend all your e education money when you're, you know, 18 to 25 because it's hard to know at 20 what you're going to want to do at 60 and you're going to have a chance to do at 60. So I think we're reshaping the whole house in a way that younger generations are going to benefit. Actually, I do want my daughter to spend all her education <laughs> money by the time she's 25, Zoe. I just want to make that <laughs> clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just everybody that counts for, except for Zoe, by the way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that's a really important aspect, though. I mean, as somebody who j just graduated and got my master's last year, and um, and it was great. I'm very proud of it. So I, I got. But I, but I say that because people would say, are you crazy? <laughs> you got such a, I have a very full-time job at the Actors Fund and doing that. But it was such a, you know, going back to school when, or my, as my friend Michelle would say, go, moving forward to school instead of back to school, um, I was able to, uh, it was a whole different experience than when I went to school when I got my bachelor's. It was just this feeling that I was doing something. I, I could, for the first time, connect. It wasn't like I was an empty slate that people were just throwing information on me. It was, I had life experience, and I was able to couple that with inf new information, and it was a totally different mm -hmm. experience in that process. Um, I want to also mention another uh, 
person that happens to be in the audience, uh, who we work with a lot, uh, uh, the Sherry Lansing Foundation, Doug Collins, who's, you want to stand up, Doug, and just take a little bow, uh, who um, does an, an, a wonderful mentoring program, uh, bringing seniors and kids together in, uh, through the UCLA program, and it's really wonderful. I have some of our clients have had the opportunity to do it, and it just, it's incredible. It enhances them in so many ways. It's that intergenerational work you know, that is so important. Um, how about you talking a little bit about experience talks and how that all got started? Because I've always been, in, I never known, I have never known the history of that. I only knew that you got it going and it's a wonderful opportunity. You got onto NPR, on an NPR station over the last couple of years, right? We, yeah, we got picked up by the Pacifica Foundation Network, so we're, we're broadcast to many, many cities now. But, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to say that I had this, this amazing, intelligent vision that I, I really want to become a radio host and spread this word across the country. But uh, one of my employees who we had just hired named Bobby Zena was actually walking down the hall of KPFK. He had a blues show and the program director had a slot to fill and said, Bobby, I like what you're doing with the blues. Do you have another idea for a show? And Maureen and I had been filling his head with with tales of older people for a couple of weeks in training. So he said, hey, how about senior citizens? And so that was the birth of the radio show. And I actually wasn't crazy about the idea because it sounded like a lot of work, frankly. And one of my other employees said, what are you, an idiot? What nonprofit has a radio show and has a voice out there? So, so I'm that idiot who, I started out as a journalist, so it's been fantastic to be able to get back to that, but, um, you know, the pinch me thing that you mentioned earlier, I, we, we experience that quite often. Um, Mark had his, his Encore Summit up in Sausalito a couple of weeks ago, and that was one of those moments where you're in a room filled with people. I come away from this conference where they give out the Purpose Prize every year, and we work hard, we're social entrepreneurs, and I meet people in their 80s and 90s and think I've got to get off my butt and do something with my life because they, they're exhaustive, mission-driven people who are absolutely amazing. And it's, you know, it's one of the greatest events is we just get to go and cover it for the radio show and hear stories. Did, did you ever interview Gene Jones for your show? Yeah, yeah, Gene, he, yeah Gene is actually a perfect example of a, of a guy who, you know, how many companies did he start? And I, I think I met him when he was 92 years old and he had, he had just created this arts program inside Arizona schools that had basically reconstituted the landscape of arts and schools in the state of Arizona. And this is a company that he started in his 80s. He was, he was 84. It was called Opening Minds <coughs> to, the, to the Arts when he created, re reaches 35,000 students a year. <laughs> Amazing um, guy. I, I should say, you know, you um, you were kind to point out that Doug's here, and Doug's uh, colleague Sherry Lansing, who's been the chair of the Purpose Prize panel of judges since the very first day, qualifies as a as a a pip, but not a previously important person, but a perpetually important person <laughs> <laughs> who keeps uh, doing these extraordinary efforts focused on improving the well-being of younger generations and future generations. And it's important to know that, you know, you guys are out there and, and everything, making things happen. Um, but this is a really crazy economy right now. And, uh, and the employment situation is very challenging. And I know for myself and anybody that works at the Actors Fund, just so you know, is an organization, uh, those of you that are not familiar with it, uh, we are a nonprofit organization that is a social service uh, that and we provide um, social service helping financially and counseling for people in the entertainment industry. Even though it's called the Actors Fund, it's for everybody in the entertainment industry. That's something we we always uh, have to uh, bring out because people don't get that right away. But the cool thing about what we do is that we are able to engage with a lot of different people, a lot of different ages, big span of people, uh, ages and and um, ethnicities and uh, incredible talent. I've got a couple of my colleagues uh, here today, uh, Karen and Caitlin, you know, and we, we really, uh, we hear amazing stories every day. But the challenge is that with what's going on out there, you know, it is true that 
the way we think in America, it's sort of like you're done, you know? You're done, and it's a very young kind of motivated setup. Um, how do we change that? How do we make that different? Well, you know, the whole way we live life was really set up for sort of three score and 10. You know, 65 was picked kind of out of the air in 1935 as the retirement age. <laughs> the irony is the first person who, who got Social Security uh, in 1940, a woman named Ida Mae Fuller, proceeded to live to 100. She paid $20.75 into the system and got $22,888.92. She's the one who's bankrupting this system. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it was crazy even in 1940. And, and now, you know, we've got, if we're heading from three score and 10 to something approximating five score, we really need to rethink what life looks like. You can't just load up all your education at the beginning, work like a maniac for 30 years and have a balloon payment of leisure. You know, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen these Prudential commercials that have been running, you know, as a first person who's going to live to 150 has already been born and all this stuff. You know, it, you can't have an 85 year retirement. So we have to really rethink all these different chapters. But the people who are coming up to this point now are completely on their own, you know, unless they're lucky enough to have some of the programs that the Actors Fund has, but it's a do-it-yourself process, and that's just too hard. Mm -hmm. We don't have public policies to help people train and go back to school and do the, the internships that they're needed, and so it, it, it feels like a cruel uh, um, uh, transition under any circumstances, but particularly under this Envi economic environment. I think politically, too, uh, one of the things that I always note, no matter what the party is, they always talk about s you know, educating our children, which I think is important, but at the same token, you don't hear very much about how do we educate or re-educate uh, our, our people as they get older. Um, it, it, you don't hear that. You really don't in terms of Congress people or senators or anything. Very true. It, it doesn't even come out. So um, what about, do you have any feelings about that regarding yeah, I'm what's going I'm on? encouraged, I think, partly by, uh, Mark and I were talking beforehand about the, f the films that have come out and, and you know, the, the Academy Awards were swept by films that have adult-minded themes. So that's pretty encouraging. And, and it, one of the things that happened at, at Mark's summit was they showed a three-minute scene from the best exotic Marigold Hotel and, and where Judy Dench was educating the the telemarketers how to talk to older people, uh, and and that film alone gives me hope because I think that that just changes the idea of the way people can do this, and so I think you know it's taken Hollywood a while to understand that there is a market for people who are intelligent and older, and. Obviously, the boomers, I am one, so I'm self-deprecating. We're a very loud generation. We're not going to go quietly into <laughs> any good night. And I think that's going to drive a lot of change, obviously. Um, I'm also very sick of the word boomer. I would like to change yeah, it to yeah. something else. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but, yeah. but I, you know, I, 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 you I'm... You can be on your next to last dog. <laughs> yes, yes. That's, that's, um, I, I, that's, that's, I, I think that's my favorite. Uh, Indian summer is good. That's, yeah. uh, that's pretty well, cool. Well, you know, that film of Hubie Jones was made... Uh, by participant media um, as part of uh, a social impact campaign related to Marigold Hotel. And the, you know, the great line in the film I always think of, you know, and sort of in response in a way to your question uh, about, y you know, how hard things are now. Dev Patel, you know, is accosted by Penelope Wilton um, uh, about why the Marigold Hotel doesn't look nearly as nice as the Photoshop brochure. And he says, you know, well, in India, we have a, an expression that everything works out in the end. So if it hasn't worked out, then it is not yet the end. <laughs> 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 but that, line, I, yeah. I think we have to do better than that when it comes <laughs> to helping people make this transition. Yeah, for sure. I always remember, I, I quote you, it ain't about bingo anymore, because I remember, uh, you know, you won't even allow bingo to be played in... <laughs> Well, uh, we allow it. I, I don't encourage it. You don't encourage, <laughs> right. You don't we've we've, you we've invented new forms of bingo, <laughs> too. It, uh, Maure Maureen and her staff have come up with ESL bingo to try and teach uh, English as a second language through bingo. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's a creative way to be able to get a little something out right. of it in terms of a learning and opportunity. And Mark's trying to figure out a way to repackage the donut for us. I, <laughs> I made a pilgrimage to Stan's Donuts before uh, coming here tonight. <laughs> well, you know, as far as um, what's going on uh, today, um, if you were going to take a look at your vision of, um, of your own life, because you've, you've gone through, I remember reading the introduction and the changes you went through in your own life and kind of looking at, look, I'm in my 50s and what am I doing and where am I going and how am I going to deal with this? Um, how much has the reflection on your own life uh, and your own process affected choices you've made in moving forward with what you're doing with your mm -hmm. programs? Well, yeah, yeah, jo Joanne uh, referenced the story. I, I'm uh, about to turn 55, and I have a three-, five-, and seven-year-old, so I'm not just uh, endorsing longer working lives as an abstract notion. <laughs> but the, uh, when, I, when I had the first two kids, I, um, I went on a family vacation, and I um, um, was trying to drive up to Portland, and I realized we couldn't make it all the way, and so I, um, I had to call around um, to try to get a hotel room and I was scrambling for the best possible rate when I realized that I qualified for that AARP discount <laughs> and I got my discount I was so proud I'd saved about 14 bucks I uh, was trumpeting this great victory to my wife and she reminded me that uh, uh, we needed two cribs in the room so I had to call back uh, the guy <laughs> at the desk who was 18 and I said yes Mr. Friedman he said yeah Mr. Senior Citizen discount I said yeah <laughs> Can I have two cribs in the room? And I, uh, so I expected to, you know, to have the entire cast of the FBI show up, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, send me off to the slammer at the door. But, you know, these oxymorons, you know, that are ev everywhere. And I, you know, I've, I do feel like, um, yeah, you know, like a lot of people, there's an imperative of working a lot longer. But I do worry, you know, I've spent um, 30 years working on the things that I am working on. How do you make a, a shift and the economics of doing that? Y you talked about going back to school. Time had an article last year about the doubling of people over 50 going to divinity school. It was called Holy Enrollers. <laughs> and yeah. it tells the story of a woman who was a pediatric nurse in Florida who becomes an Episcopal priest and it costs her $100,000. She has to sell her house and her car, you know, and <laughs> It's very expensive to make these kinds of transitions, and I think we've got to help people underwrite that cost. Why not be able to take a couple of years of Social Security in your 50s or early 60s to go back to school to do what you did or to do an internship, um, uh, gap year for grownups? Um, it, so I think, I th I think we, we need to figure out um, how to do that, and I, I see in my own life, you know, I don't feel like I have a lot of latitude or flexibility to uh, even think about something new. Yeah, I think we, we all have to kind of have a real open mind in terms of how we, how we even think about our vision of what we want it to look like, mm -hmm. because we are in a, in a very changing area, although it feels like it's not moving sometimes, yeah. right? Um, so I would like to open this up now to the audience to ask questions, and we have some people who will come right down the aisle with microphones. So if you raise your hand and say you'd like to have a question, we've got a question right over here. Uh, um, the question is for Tim, and um, I came here um, hoping to solve like this, you know, problem, um, which is affordable housing in Los Angeles, especially for seniors, especially uh, people in the acting community, um, uh, SAG actors or even um, non-union actors. Um, there is nothing here. I mean, there is in New York, but there isn't anything L in LA for affordable housing for senior citizens. And um, I was hoping, Tim, you can answer um, the question. There, uh, we have several projects actually that are opening this year. Um, there's there's an arts colony opening right now in Long Beach that's 100% affordable, the first 100% affordable senior arts oriented housing in the country. And it's 200 units, uh, there's a theater, there's art studios, performance areas, art gallery, it's pretty amazing. It's in Long Beach. It's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a trek. The the uh, low income units in NoHo are already leased up, 
Um, but we're, I, I, I can give you my card when we're done and I'd be happy to tell you all about any place you want to know. But the idea of solving the issue of affordable housing, I mean, it's an interesting moment in time because as part of the Budget Balancing Act in the state of California, we killed the California Redevelopment Agencies last year, which will be an interesting challenge to once again link the idea of affordable and housing in California get together, which was all, always a tightrope walk, obviously. It, it, nothing is affordable. Um, there, it's very hard to make these deals pencil. But there are still quite a few affordable housing projects being built. And I think one of the things that's great is I think the bar is being raised in how these places are constructed, the types of programs they have in place, the types of physical amenities that are in the building. And I think that, that th that's going to be something that pushes this thing and, and, and makes it happen in a way that we haven't seen before. Talk in your mic. Oh, sorry. Oh, there you go, yeah. um, yes, there's a lot of um, senior places, like 55 and older places, yep. but yep. the rents are like $1,000 a month. And um, they're just like any other place. It's just that everybody is 55 and over. There's no difference. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not sure of the rent structure as much, um, but I'd be glad to give you the information on the places that we are. And I think one of the great things about the, the buildings that we're in is it's not only an affordable place to live, but there's also pretty cool stuff going on downstairs, too. There's classes and programs and arts programs. And so I think for older people who are interested in that type of lifestyle, it's a, it's a perfect storm. I'd be glad to give you my card and help help you find the place, and I I, I welcome anybody to, to to take me up on that. And the I think my website and stuff is in your handout there, and my email is in there, so everybody here is welcome to email me. Um, I've loved what I've heard tonight. This is absolutely fabulous. I'm uh, uh, I, I've been a businesswoman all my life. I retired a few years ago, and uh, I'm writing. And so this is my second career, and I'm just loving it. But what I wanted to say is um, I was one of the casualties of the, uh, uh, the housing bubble. I had a condo that I bought in 2004, and uh, uh, last year I, uh, I had to, uh, I lost it in a short sale. I had to. I had um, gone through some financial reverses and had some illness and so forth, and it uh, um, just wasn't meant to be. So I was out uh, looking for housing. And what I did was I, I went to senior centers all over Los Angeles, and they had lists of, of apartments where they had low-income housing for seniors. Now, the caveat is they put you on a list, and you're on it for five years. So that's not good news. I mean, you got to find a place to live in the meantime. But I feel absolutely like a miracle. I have an absolutely beautiful one-bedroom apartment that I got <coughs> through um, one of these agencies that was the um, ALA Aging, let's see, Affordable Living for, for the, the Aging, aging. Population. Yeah. yeah, it's a great, great organization. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, I'm one of those people. So we've got it. We've got it here, pal. <laughs> they, I, the uh, ALA did that writing project last year where they published the book. Who, they, they, are you familiar with that? I, I went. We, I, I think you were there with me, Maureen. We we went to a uh, an event that ALA put on um, honoring one of the developers that we work with, and and uh, they gave out a book that they published through the um, Penn Foundation, and it's amazing, all written by residents of the ALA housing. Uh, go, go, if you go on their website, it's on their website. I can't remember the name of the book, but, it, but it's on their website. It's amazing. And I, I can give you my car. I have a copy of it at home if you want me to email you with the information. Great. Great. Uh, hi. I had a question, uh, especially with the senior population as um, people develop illnesses and ailments and are on medications. Um, how does, could you just help me understand uh, it seems that some of the work that you do, it helps them find a sense of purpose, a sense of fulfillment, 
a mission. Um, how, th- does that is it harder when you're dealing with a segment of the population that has perhaps maybe the developing dementia or Alzheimer's or some types of age related illness, or is it actually maybe even therapeutic because it, it they can uh, they're aggressively utilizing their minds to uh, combat um, their ailment. Um, and maybe it's taking their mind away from the pain or the suffering. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, it, it, um, as Joanne mentioned, I, I was involved uh, for many years on a project uh, called Experience Corps, which was uh, adopted last year by AARP. It's in 20 communities around the country, and it's groups of 10 to 15 people over the age of 55 who are working as a team to uh, help uh, young people read by by grade three. And built into the design of the project are a whole set of, um, of, um, of provisions to do just what you were describing. So in the schools, it's set up so that people h- walk stairs and have, um, you know, physical activity built into the day-to-day work so that they're not sedentary, but also the the ties of ha- of being part of a team um, are so important, um, partly for the social connection, but also because as people develop various issues, others in the team can compensate so that they can still be involved. You're not just left on your own. So and it turns out that there's a bunch of research that's been done by Johns Hopkins Medical School and also by Washington University in St. Louis that shows all these cognitive benefits of being involved in, in that project. And I, I give that example not just to say that experience core is the answer, but I think many kinds of efforts that provide this kind of purpose and connection and physical activity as part of it, it can really help both prolong people's um, mental and physical health and then compensate um, when some of those issues do start to appear. I've heard some studies uh, where um, when um, with people, with Alzheimer's patients, where when th- they may not recognize you or they may not know the word, but they will remember music. Somebody will sing a song or play something, and then they'll start to, and it will trigger something, and they'll be able to uh, process, which is interesting that music has such a really powerful mm-hmm. role in our lives, even in, mm-hmm. in that particular state. Okay. This question relates to people who have never really actualized their potential, but they still have hopes of being the writer or artist or musician that they always dreamed of and maybe dabbled in on the side. So do you have any suggestions for how to um, tap into that creative energy and um, actualize it and um, in the second half of life? Uh, do, you, do you want to start? Yeah, it's the, um, I, 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 those are my favorite stories. I mean, we, we serve you know, 6,000 seniors in three counties here in, in Southern California, and a lot of the people that we serve are not artists but have some tickling that, that they might be one. Um, and those are always my favorite stories. The, the, the Burbank Senior Artist Colony was this idea of, wouldn't it be cool if we had everybody who came in here and had art as the glue that held the community together instead of old age? And one of the women who moved in was somebody who thought she might be a writer. She had never really done anything for herself. And she was a, a, a single mom raising two kids, working two jobs, and in retirement thought, you know, I think I might be a writer. I'm going to try this. And went to a writing class and wrote this little short film called Bandita. Um, and it was terrific. And we made it, made the film. She ended up on Ira Glass's this American Life on Showtime, and her film won in competition at the at the Valley Film Festival. And so I, I think all, all it took for her was just seeing a, a place that where she could go and take a class, and she happened to live there. It was walking downstairs, but also just going for it. You know, I mean, I my my daughter is learning piano and and voice, and I you know I I started trying to learn piano, and I'm learning to paint and. I've never done any of this stuff before either. I was a writer, and I just don't feel like writing because I write too many dang grant applications. So I don't, it's a busman's holiday for me to go home and write. Um, so the idea of just 
doing it and and taking a class and accessing it you know there are, you, the woman mentioned senior centers i mean there are so many classes and opportunities for people to engage in creative activity and just try it and one of one of mark and i, I favorite colleagues who just passed away a few years ago gene cohen who has this incredible research on aging and creativity and the effect that creativity has on people's health and I, I interviewed him on our radio show and I asked him about the creative process and he said, you know, what's interesting is that you don't have to write Ulysses to fire neurons. Writing a limerick does the same thing. <laughs> and, and so we try and teach people in our classes that you don't have to be great at it. You just have to love the process of doing it. And I think that's the way that, I mean, it's certainly the way that I, you mentioned how, how do you apply your personal life to it? I mean, all of this is about your personal life because all of it applies to you while you're doing it. I want to just also speak to community um, because being around other people that are doing what you love doing is, is a way to be able to enhance whatever you want to do. I'm thinking about Clara, you know, like that and this wonderful opportunity I had when I was working uh, with Engage, where um, there uh, is a woman there uh, uh, who had, she wanted to show me her collection. She had all these these uh, needle points and the beautiful stitchery. She had a wedding gown that her mother had had to uh, send through, Czech get from Czechoslovakia. They had, to, they had to send it in pieces, you know, so that she could get the whole piece. And um, Clara was from Transylvania. Tr from Transylvania. And um, she... I didn't even know people were actually from I went from up, she had, a, she had a cup of tea for me, and we, you know, she, I went through her stuff, and I saw her stuff that she, with her permission, of course. And um, I, I just thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if she presented that. So we just sort of dropped the seed of her presenting it and so she, and she was really into it and she'd never really done a presentation before and I had big cards and I showed her how to you know get the fonts big enough so she could read it. I learned that if you have a hearing aid you, you know with the mic it's a problem so you have to pop it out and all these things I never even knew about. But what was so cool about it was that I came back and I was worried about oh what are we going to do in between. She had gotten all the different people that had done needlepoint and uh, embroidery and all that and she had brought them all and had them, their stuff on the table that she had them out there and they did all we did was just say it was something Maureen used to always say to me just throw the seed out you know let them figure out how to do it and they did and it, I could have never produced or directed anything as creative as what they did and it was just saying yes to something and and opening up the door and there was the creativity it was all all just available it was just waiting for somebody to say would you let me in you know it was, it was amazing another question there's a question right in the back oh we'll go here first and then we'll go it's to not you. a question it's a statement uh creativity is about moving forward not moving back and at age six, six, 65 creativity does not end so we move into a second phase of life and move forward with our creativity. So I think we need to take the title of tonight's workshop, uh, Serious Creative Longevity. Let's move forward. We don't need to follow these rules that somebody made up <laughs> and said at age 65, it's the end. It's up to us to make it move forward. So become creative. Thank you. Creative here, longevity. Here, here. here, here. That's and we'll take a few more questions. There's a gentleman in the back uh, right there. His hand is up. Hi. Uh, uh, Tim, this is for you. Uh, my wife and I had the pleasure of going through your NoHo community, <laughs> and it is quite extraordinary. Uh, it's really wonderful. It's exciting. The only problem for those looking for affordable housing is that uh, the vast majority of those units are at market price. Uh, right. The affordable housing component is taken up, I don't know what your percentage is, and I know it's got to do with the city in which you construct them, Right. but the vast, uh, the smallest amount, I don't know what the percentage is, but they're taken right away and there's a waiting list of 20 years. So your idea is a wonderful one, and, and I compliment you on it, but uh, I don't know what the... Uh, 
what the problems are when you go to do this. It has to do with the city and how much they kick in, I guess. So, but I do compliment you on the, the ideas. Just, just great. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the NOHO one, the percentage of low-income units is relatively low. And uh, one of the reasons why it happened so, so well in Long Beach and get, we got 200 affordable units there versus 30 or something like that in, in NOHO was Long Beach wanted huge affordability in the project and put in an enormous amount of subsidy to the project. And when we came through the Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Los Angeles, it was at, on the tail end of all of the redevelopment agencies running out of money. So the, the affordability was limited by what we could do in terms of getting the city subsidy to a point that would subsidize X number of units versus Y number of units. So yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's, it's going to get a, unfortunately become a tougher process with what's going on with the redevelopment agencies. Hmm. But there's something about creating that model, you know, uh, to be able to get that out there that maybe other people may find other ways of being able to make that workable, you know, if you're going to think of possibilities. I think uh, that's one way to look at it, too. I have another question, uh, right, because we're right near the mic there. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if either of you, to take the lady's question over there into a slightly different arena, there are a lot of very talented professionals who reach a certain age where <clears throat> the forces of the industries they work in shunt them to the sidelines and they are unable to find work in their chosen artistic professions. And I'm wondering if either of you have thought about taking your own expertise, your own uh, experiences and your own contacts and, and abilities uh, in your respective arenas and for ex taking uh, moving outside the enclosed arena of, of development, of sp certain specific development, or outside of the prize of giving uh, someone clearly uh, deserving of what they're getting, but directing those energies and those forces and that money into uh, liaisoning perhaps with uh, artistic guilds and, and, and unions, et cetera, who have a, an enormous membership of people who are still extremely vibrant and talented and creative, but find it very difficult to work in their respective arenas. Has, has that idea uh, been kicking around in either of your heads? And, and is there any, uh, do you spot any avenues for that kind of a uh, synergy? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, this is a little bit of a roundabout answer to what you're saying, but I mean, even in the case of these people like we saw in those two videos, the, this chapter that they had drew very heavily on what they were doing beforehand. It was in a different form. You know, Tom Cox used his legal skills in this other arena. And, you know, in contrast to all these reinvention stories, we hear that, you know, most of these second acts that people have are really rooted in the earlier acts. And I think what's missing, though, since most people aren't going to become social entrepreneurs, are our pathways. I, we, we provide a whole set of pathways for young people navigating their way from being teenagers to being at adults. Shouldn't we do the same kinds of things for people at this other transition? And what we've been focused on at Encore.org are two paths in particular. Um, one is school for the second half of life. You know, we developed this whole lifelong learning thing, you know, beginning with Elder Hostel, which is wonderful, but it's different from what people really need making the transition you were describing. And the other one, which I think is even more important, are internships. There's a, a lot of research about people at every age who successfully change careers, you know, when what they were doing before kind of runs its course. And it all turns out that it's mostly about experimenting. All that stuff about discovering your bliss and your dream job and everything isn't very valuable. You, you need to just find a way to get in the door and try it on. So we created something called the Encore Fellowship, which is a nine to 12 month fellowship, $25,000 half time for people who are interested in working in health, the environment, um, education. And um, it's being uh, reproduced around the country. The California Healthcare Foundation is placing Encore Fellows in community health clinics around the state, for example. Um, Intel has pledged that every single 
retirement eligible Intel employee in the United States who wants to do an Encore fellowship can do one that they'll pay the $25,000 COBRA coverage during that period. Um, it's a whole different approach to HR. Those are just two examples. Obviously, it needs to be much more widespread, but I'd like to see a school for the second half of life, essentially, that helps people translate those skills and internships for grownups um, and happening through things like the guild. So, um, you know, I think all, what we need to do to start is just translate a lot of what we do for young people to people at this other transition. I, I think in, in, a, in a small way, we're, we're trying to make a dent in that by trying to create positions for teaching artists in what we do. And I'm on the board of the National Center for Creative Aging, and, and they have a website, and there, there are protocols around how to create programs around teaching artists. And that, I think, is an example of what can be a transition of skills from one place to another. And obviously, I know it's a tough position to be in in the entertainment industry as you get older. It's it's definitely a youth-oriented place, and it's, it's, a, it's something that has never made any sense. So I think the idea that Mark is talking about in trying to identify what the skills are and then apply them to some type of social innovation. The tough place that we're in right now is that we live in the state of California and we're, we're seeing huge budget cuts in education. So that obviously doesn't help on the other end of things too because we're seeing schools being pressured to outsource things like arts and PE. You know, my daughter goes to a performing arts school and she's just lucky that she does so she gets arts programming, but that's not obviously the case in, in all of LAUSD, which has, what, 900 schools. It's, it's like a city unto itself. And there are things going on. I mean, I know like Jackie uh, Goldberg is here uh, who, who does the uh, Pink Lady, <laughs> who uh, does a whole program on, uh, on theater uh, for, for seniors that you have to be 60 or over even to audition or to 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 work backstage and uh, I've gone to these shows and they're been, they've been amazing I think there's a lot of things that are happening but it's creating the community around it so that we can support it um, we, we're, we're running to that time uh, we are going to be having cookies and coffee and tea out on the uh, uh, it, as soon as you walk out of the theater and uh, so we can continue the conversation um, but I do want to say that um, I think that how, how do you feel did you get some information that is useful to you number one okay. that's the most important thing uh, I feel honored to be sitting between these two gentlemen because I think they offer an incredible uh, amount of information and insight and experience around what we need to be doing but the conversation needs to continue and it needs to continue with you you know I mean we can all talk from up here and say what what should be done or what could be done but we have a great opportunity to make it happen and that's what our jobs are uh, when we get back out there um, the other thing I wanted to do is, is just say thank you to um, Claudia Bestor for partnering with me uh, and the Actors Fund to be able to do this presentation this evening um, I think this is something that we need to have more opportunities to talk about, more forums around it, and this is just such a wonderful, um, beautiful way to be able to get that going. And I also want to thank uh, the Actors Fund and the Hammers Museum for coming together uh, to in our first collaboration. Um, the Actors Fund, uh, you know, it so goes with our, both of our missions are being able to get. Uh, something out there for the creative soul, you know, to keep on growing. And, um, and I think we did that tonight. And uh, I thank you for being in attendance. And I hope you join us for coffee and cookies afterwards.